Hello and welcome back to Physics 141 Classical Electromagnetism 1. So before we proceed with today's lesson, let us first review some of the concepts that we need to better understand today's lesson. So we have discussed about Coulomb's law in as a way to solve for the electric field for continuous charge distributions. So we also have discussed an alternative uh, way in finding the electric field of continuous charge distributions and that is Gauss law. So Gauss law has an integral form and a differential form. So the integral form is usually used if you want to find the total charge Q but if you want to solve for the charge density rho then you need to use the differential form. We also need to review some basic vector calculus for uh, that are needed for this lesson. So we need to know or review the gradient and the Laplacian operator. So in Cartesian, this is the gradient operator. It's just a differential operator which transforms a scalar function f into a vector function. And this is the Laplacian function. Uh, the Laplacian function is basically a second order uh, differential operator and it can apply to both scalar and vector functions so in cylindrical coordinates these are the gradient and the laplacian and in spherical coordinates these are the gradient and laplacian uh, operators so for today's lesson we will be discussing about the electric potential so you may have already discussed about the electric potential in your physics 41 basic electromagnetism course and it's basically just related to electric field and the electric potential energy so you can think of the electric potential as energy per unit charge so that's actually it's a, a basic a definite definition so for this uh, lesson, we will try to generalize on how to find the electric potential of a charge distribution. So let's now start today's lesson. So electric potential is usually measured with respect to a reference point. So this is the one of the definitions of the electric potential at a distance r or say at a point a distance r from the origin or from a charge distribution rather. So we usually measure the potential electric potential with respect to a reference point so this is the electric field here this is the differential length it's along the line connecting the reference point and the point where you the field point the point where you are trying to find the electric potential uh, usually we take infinity as the reference point since we can always assume that the potential there is zero so essentially this equation will give you a potential difference the potential difference at point r with respect to a reference point usually we take uh, the reference point as infinity so if you take now the potential difference between two points so one of the points becomes the reference so in this case, A is our uh, reference uh, point. Now, if we go back to your uh, mathematical physics, you have discussed about the fundamental theorem for uh, gradients. So if you have a function evaluated at one point minus the function evaluated at another point, that's actually basically just the gradient of that function that with the differential length so you will notice that our equation here looks similarly like this and this means that at our electric field is just the gradient of our function which in this case our function is the 
electric potential function. So, if you know the electric potential, you can actually solve for the electric field. And based on this first equation here, if you know the electric field, you can also solve for the electric potential. So, take note, electric potential is a scalar function. It is not a vector function. So, gradient means from small to large or from small to big or from uh, low to high or from light to dark so that essentially the layman's uh, definition for gradient okay so for example you have a positive charge distribution and for a positive charge distribution the potential gradient is actually in this direction it's actually the potential is increasing along this uh, direction so far away from the charge positive charge distribution the potential is uh, small but as you go near the positive charge distribution the potential increases so the gradient is in this direction so according to this uh, equation it's the electric field is the negative gradient so meaning the direction of the electric field for a positive charge distribution is opposite the direction of the gradient so if you have a negative a charge distribution then the gradient direction is opposite it's radially outward which means the electric field will be radially inward such as the case of a negative point charge so the electric potential can also be written in terms of Coulomb's law so here this is the Coulomb's law for uh, electric field where this part here rho d tau is our d cube uh, by the way, we need to shift our variable for volume since originally in the previous lessons we designate volume as V. But as you can see, there's now a conflict in variable since we use a V now for the potential. So we need to shift our variable for volume as tau. So rho, rho d tau is our dq here. So based on our previous lesson we can actually change this to sigma da or lambda dl depending on what type of charge distribution so for continuous charge distribution if we get if we dot this electric field with dl then we get the coulomb's law for continuous charge distribution so again the rho d tau here can be replaced by uh, sigma da or lambda dl depending on your charge distribution. Okay, but before we go to a continuous case, let's first have an example for a discrete case. So you have a point charge Q, positive point charge Q, and you are asked to find the electric potential due to a point charge Q, a distance r from the point charge. So, we already know the electric field of a point charge. It's given by Coulomb's law. 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught or K, Q over R squared, its direction is R hat. So, if you use the definition of the electric potential at point R and make the, our reference point as infinity, then using the definition or the value for electric field of a point charge that with our dl here our dl is along the r axis so it's dr and its direction is r hat so you have r hat dot with r hat that's essentially one so you take the constants out of the integral and what remains inside the integral will be dr over r squared so you have integral of dr over r squared and that's actually just a very simple integral the integral of dr over r squared is just uh one over negative one over r and since there's a negative sign here it becomes a positive so this is now the coulomb's law for electric potential for the discrete na case so this is just for a single uh point charge we can actually do the do the process in reverse so for example you are given the electric potential and you are asked to find the electric field then you use the negative gradient uh, formula so since this is uh, spherical coordinates we need to use the diff uh, the gradient in spherical coordinates 
So if this is our uh, electric potential, you will notice that it only depends on one spherical coordinate, R. There's no theta, there's no phi. Therefore, the gradient is simply partial of V with respect to R, R hat. And there's a negative sign. So if you take the, the first derivative of this, the only variable here is R. So the derivative of 1 over R is negative 1 over R squared. And there's a negative sign here. And you will get back the Coulomb's law for electric field. KQ over R squared R hat. So uh, you can get the pot electric potential from the electric field and you get you can get the electric field from the electric potential okay so let's now have a continuous charge distribution example so suppose you have a sphere spherical shell and there's a uniform charge Q distributed along the surface of your uh, sphere of radius R so we can actually solve this in two ways. So the first way is to calculate the electric field first, which we have done in the previous uh, lessons. So since there's no charge uh, inside this spherical shell, then by virtue of Gauss law, the electric field inside is zero. And since the electric field, the total charge uh, enclosed, uh, if you make a Gaussian surface outside is the total charge Q then the electric field outside is KQ over R squared it looks like the electric field of a point charge so knowing this uh, knowing that the electric field inside is zero doesn't necessar necessarily mean that the potential inside is also zero take note that if the derivative of a function is zero it only means that that function is constant at best so it doesn't necessarily mean that it's zero it could just be a constant so here we will assume that the potential inside is constant which means that there's no gradient of electric field sorry of electric potential inside the electric potential is the same there's no increase in uh, potential there's no decrease in potential in fact the electric potential inside the sphere is constant and the value of this is the potential at the surface so if we can now first uh, solve for the electric field outside so using our equation so e dot dl so our electric field outside is this one and our dl is the r r hat so you have r hat that r hat that's still equal to one and the only thing inside the left inside the integral will be the r over r squared so again that will give you uh, some kq over r 1 over 4 pi epsilon not q over r so this is the potential electric potential outside now, at R is equal to capital R, at the surface, the electric potential is actually just replace R, small r, by capital R. And that's actually your potential inside the uh, spherical shell. So this means that the potential inside is 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught Q over capital R. It's a constant up to the surface, where after the surface, the potential decreases by 1 over R so this also means that the potential is continuous at the boundary so the potential is continuous it it it, it is not uh, it is not discontinuous so we can actually uh, also summarize our answer like this such that the potential at r for r is less than or equal to capital r is this one the potential inside and for r is greater than or equal to capital r it's the is this one the electric potential outside now let's try solving this without using electric field so 
we will now try using uh, Reculum's law for electric potential for continuous charge distribution. Okay, so this is a surface charge distribution. So meaning our dq here is sigma dA. And since the charge Q is uniformly distributed, distributed over the surface, and this means that sigma is constant and it's just equal to the total charge which is Q over the total surface area of the sphere which is 4 pi capital R squared. Our dA here is also uh, given as this in spherical coordinates. Note that our R here, our all of our source charges are at R is equal to capital R at the surface only. So we have capital R here instead of small r. And uh, our field point, we, since our field point is only a single, a single point, we can actually let this uh, point, our field point, to be along the z-axis uh, with a distance uh, r. So r z hat. So r can be less than the radius for the potential inside, and r can be greater than the radius, capital R, for potential outside. So R is actually variable here. So this is our R prime, the position of our source uh, charges. It's actually capital R, capital R and, in the, and its direction is R hat. And therefore, this is our curly R vector, our separation distance vector. But actually, we don't need the separation distance vector, only its magnitude. So take note here that this is now a, this is not a right triangle. And this angle, by the way, the angle between R and R prime is the polar angle theta. So based on the general cosine law for a generic triangle, so... The, this side here is just equal to the square root of the square of one side, the square of the other side, minus uh, 2 r r cosine uh, between the angle of the two sides, r and r prime. Okay, so we use this value, substitute it here. We also use the value of sigma, substitute it here and take it out of the integral. So what's left with our uh, integral inside our integral will be this one so you will notice the there's an r squared in the numerator there's an uh, capital r squared in the denominator and these two will cancel each other out so inside the integral will just be sine theta d theta d phi and the curly r which is this one the square root uh, term so you will also notice that this is a surface integral meaning this is a double integral so you integrate over phi and theta so you will notice there's only one term that contains phi it's just the differential of phi or phi prime rather so we can actually integrate this first integral of d phi from 0 to 2 pi uh, theta is the polar angle it's uh, integrated from 0 to pi so the integral of d phi will give you 2 pi so there's a 2 pi here you can take that 2 pi out and you can simplify the integral further to this one. So we are now left with only one integral. Uh, integral over uh, phi from 0 to pi. Now, how do you solve this integral? So this is just a fairly easy uh, integral. So first, we need to solve for the indefinite integral. We, so that we can, we'll no longer have to change our uh, limits. So we will let the term inside the square root as our new variable u so r squared plus capital r squared minus 2 r r cosine theta prime okay so meaning the differential of u so we are uh, in differentiating with respect to theta so this has no differential 0 0 and this one the differential of cosine theta is negative sine theta there's a negative sign so it becomes positive so 2 r r sine theta prime d theta prime so that's a differential so this is the term that we need <coughs> sine theta prime d theta prime which means 
uh, sine theta prime d theta prime is equal to du over 2 capital R small r. Okay, so we substitute this in our integral here. So this now becomes u to the power i square root of u or u to the one half. And that integral becomes <coughs> so du and there's a factor now 1 over 2 capital R small r over u to the uh, square root of u or u to the one half. So this is just a very easy integral u to the negative one half uh, du. So <coughs> this will give you so you have 1 over 2 capital R small r and the integral of this is you have negative 1 half So this will actually give you the integral of u to the negative one half uh, du, and this is just so u to the negative one half plus one. So you will have u to the one half over uh, one half, or uh, you can transfer one half. To the, to the numerator, there's a 2 here, and this is the answer of this indefinite integral here. Meaning, if we go back to our original definition of u, so this is just 1 over r, r, and then square root of u, where u is r squared plus capital R squared minus 2 r r uh, cosine theta prime. So that one. So the answer of this integral here is uh, this one. Okay. So if we evaluate evaluate this from zero to since this is just an indefinite integral, so we need to evaluate this from zero to pi. So what will happen to this term when we evaluate this from 0 to pi? So, when theta prime is equal to pi, you have cosine uh, pi, which is negative 1. Negative 1, there's a negative sign. And the evaluation will be square root of r squared plus capital R squared. And it's now plus 2rr. This is the evaluation at pi uh, minus the evaluation at zero. So at zero, when cosine uh, theta is equal to zero, cosine zero is one, so still negative. R squared plus R squared minus two R R. Okay. We can actually factor out this. This is a perfect square, and this is just R plus capital R squared square root and this term here is just uh, square root of r minus r squared okay the value of this is just r plus r since both uh, small r and capital r are positive the value of this is the absolute value of r minus r Take note that this is a square root. The answer of a square root is always a positive value. So it's an absolute value of r minus r. So the square root of r minus r squared is absolute value of r minus r. So <coughs> this one. So this will now be your general potential function. So if you will notice, unlike in our previous solution, we only have one function, which is this function, that describes the potential everywhere, inside and outside. Now, let's take the special cases uh, when small r is less than r, and sorry, 
uh, this value here is just equivalent to capital R minus R. They're just uh, the same. So I, I think I've used capital R minus R here. Okay. And in here, uh, this is just addition, so the ordering doesn't matter. Okay. So if we take the potential inside, for instance, so that is uh, for the potential inside. So inside, your small r is less than the big r, the radius. And what happens to your potential? So when r, small r, is less than uh, big r, this means that the absolute value of r minus r, the positive value of r minus r, for instance, since r is larger, is just equal to r minus r. That one. So you have r, capital R, plus small r minus capital R, then due to the negative sign, it becomes a plus r. So you will get uh, the r, capital R, will cancel each other out, and you will get 2r. And that will give you the potential insight, which is uh, this one. So there's a 2, this term will just become 2r, small r. So the small r will cancel, it, cancel out. There's a 2, there's an 8, so 1 over 4 by q over capital R. Now, for the potential outside, meaning an r, capital R, small r is greater than the radius. So this means that the absolute value of r minus, uh, capital R minus r is just equal to, since uh, small r now is bigger, so it's r minus capital R. And what happens with this term is that it just becomes 2 capital R. So capital R will cancel each other, will cancel here. The capital R in the numerator and denominator will cancel. And you are left with small r. And that's the potential here, the potential outside. So, but these two potentials inside and outside are just described generally by this single potential function okay whoa what happened so we now know uh, these things that the electric field is just a gradient of your potential and that the divergence of the electric field will give you this one Gauss law and that the curl of the field is zero so if we use this definition in the curl and divergence for example we start with the curl first so the curl of E which is the negative gradient of potential is equal to zero uh, just basically confirms the mathematical uh, definition of the curl of a gradient so the curl of a gradient is always zero because if you have a gradient the most uh, if you have a if you have a gradient uh, of a function uh, this can only mean that it's divergent the field uh, due to that function is the divergent it's it, it's not curling it's actually uh, diverging such as in the case of an electrostatic field now for the divergence of E if E is the negative gradient of your potential so the divergence of a gradient is actually the operator that we call a Laplacian operator and in this case uh, the Laplacian of V is just negative rho over uh, epsilon so this is what we call actually what we call Poisson's equation and the case where or in the region where the charge distribution is zero the Poisson's equation becomes what we call the Laplace equation so but the operation called del squared is the Laplacian operator so suppose you have a charge distribution here with charge density rho and there's an electric field outside so if you are trying to find uh, 
the potential in this region you can use the Poisson's equation but if you are trying to find the electric uh, sorry potential in this region you can actually use Laplace equation but as we have uh, demonstrated in the previous example the potential in this region and in this region could just be described by one general potential function meaning you can always choose a region of empty space where there's no charge distribution and use Laplace equation to solve for the general potential function which can also describe the potential inside the charge distribution so actually that is the focus of the next chapter it's all about techniques in solving the Laplace equation because if you have solved the Laplace equation so you know the potential now if you know the potential you can solve for the electric field and if you know the potential you can solve for the charge density so those are the three main uh, elements of electrostatics the electric field the electric potential and the charge density so what will happen if you have a surface and this is the area vector of the surface along this normal uh, unit vector normal means perpendicular to the surface so what do you think is the difference uh, with the electric field that is going to the surface and the electric field that is uh, going out of the surface in this case the electric field below is going into the surface and the electric field above is going out of the surface so the difference between these two electric fields depends on whether there is a charge distribution on the surface so you will notice that the difference between the two electric fields depends on the charge distribution in the surface if there is no charge distribution in the surface then the electric field below and the electric field above will be continuous it will not be discontinuous so you will notice here that if you transfer it in the other side of the equation the electric field above is actually the electric field below plus a sigma over epsilon naught uh, term so there will be an additional electric field that goes out if ever uh, there's a surface charge distribution so but this is on the the only component of the, the electric field that's affected by this is actually is just the normal component the component of the field that is perpendicular to the surface uh, in the case of the electric potential even if there is or there is not uh, there is no uh, surface charge distribution in the surface the potential will always be uh, continuous so the electric uh, sorry the electric potential above and the electric potential below uh, will be uh, will have the same value that's that's what continuity means they will have the same value at the surface however its derivative or the gradient is discontinuous by an amount of sigma over uh, epsilon so the gradient here is with respect to the normal coordinate the coordinate that is uh, perpendicular to the surface so if your n hat here is along the x axis then this derivative is with respect to x if this is along the r axis then this is derivative with respect to r so n is just the coordinate normal or perpendicular to the surface so we will have more boundary conditions problem when we go to the next uh, chapter when we discuss about uh, how to solve Laplace equation to solve for the electric potential so as a summary of electrostatic equations there are these these are the trinity elements of electrostatics charge density rho electric potential V and electric field E now if you are given the charge density rho and you want to find the electric potential V then you will use the Coulomb's law for electric potential and if you have the reverse situation you are given the electric potential and you need to find the charge density rho then you can use Poisson's equation you just get the Laplacian of V so that you will get rho 
Now, if you are given with uh, the charge density rho and you are asked to find E, then of course you need to use uh, Coulomb's law. And in the reverse scenario, if you are given E and you are uh, you want to find rho, then you use the differential form of Gauss law. So you just get the divergence of your electric field to solve for rho. And given the electric field, and you are asked to solve for the potential, so E dot dl. And if the reverse, given the potential, solve for the electric field, then uh, you get uh, you use the negative gradient uh, formula. So you just get the negative gradient of your potential to solve for the electric field. So this is the summary of our equations here. So you try uh, solving uh, these problems, apply those uh, uh, electrostatic equations for these three scenarios. So actually we have uh, solved these problems before in our previous lessons. Uh, you are asked to, to find the potential in electric field. So you actually have uh, found or solved for the electric field of these three uh, charge distributions. This one is discrete and these two are continuous charge distributions. So for the potential, you are to get these uh, values. Okay. So for so that ends this lesson. So for the next uh, lesson, we will be talking about uh, work and energy in electrostatics. So how do you measure the energy of a system? And it's actually uh, related to how much work you do in assembling that charge distribution in the first place. So that's it for today and I will see you in our next lesson. Thank you.